Hi, everyone. Happy Friday here to you all. And certainly I uh, want to thank you for joining us here for the inaugural edition of Talking Jersey. I am uh, your favorite professor and, of course, New Jersey's premier journalist, Fernando Uribe. And joining me here is former state assemblywoman and New Jersey's premier advocate, Maria Rodriguez Gregg, as we bring you Talking Jersey with Maria and Fernando. Maria, what's going on? Hey, how are you? I just well, want you to know that I'm not tagged in this, so it's not streaming on my Facebook page. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, folks, you know, um, special programming note, there's still some technical glitches that we have to work out with this with this new series here online. But we, again, we appreciate you um, joining us here. And I don't know if I went live either. Let me make sure to see if I did. And if not, then I'm going to do that as well. So I let me uh, Friday. Okay. Yep. So folks. We, uh, yep, it's uh, streaming live, so that's great. Well, Maria, it's 2021, and you know, just to give our audience a little bit of a context is, you know, this is something we've been talking about for some time. You know, mm -hmm. you're obviously you have a great following. You're a former legislator. You're on really the political radar all the time. And when I had you on my Insider NJ podcast, Politically Direct, last year, you know, we had a great episode. I think we had a good back and forth and a really good flow. And I know when we talked, you know, over the holiday season that starting this series would be, I think, crucial. And I think it's going to be beneficial for New Jersey voters because 2021 is a big year, right? We have a gubernatorial election. You know, all 120 legislative seats are up for grabs, which constitutes 80 in the Assembly, 40 in the State Senate. And well, listen, we'll certainly, you know, pick each other's brain a little bit later in the program about what that means. But let's start off with the gubernatorial race. And we know that Governor Murphy is seeking re-election, and history isn't really on Governor Murphy's side, okay? Yeah. Last Democrat who got re-elected as governor was way before, you know, way before we were ever born, you know, Brendan Burns. So history is not on the governor's side, but, you know, again, some polling tells you that Phil Murphy is in really good position to get re-elected. I don't know about you, uh, but there's a lot to sort of unpackage with that. Before we get to who his potential opponent will be, you know, how do you see Governor Murphy's chances? Because, I mean, again, history isn't on, on his side, but polling would say different. I mean, it's not on his side, but of course, polling does say different because of this pandemic. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are supportive of how he has handled the pandemic. I mean, when I say supportive, I would say that they're not 100 percent behind him. Of course, everybody, you know, has room for disagreement on his side of the party. But for the most part, there are a lot of people that, you know, appreciate that he's had what they perceive to be a measured response. To try and curtail uh, the, you know, numbers of infected people with coronavirus. Well, you know, it's really weird because I was just in Florida a few weeks ago and it might be apples, you know, apples and oranges, but I just saw, again, whether it's 50% indoor dining, you know, you know, a gallon of gas is much cheaper in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed that it, it, Florida's governed a lot better and we're seeing the economic climate in Florida still strong despite COVID. And I understand that, listen, again, we're talking about where we live here, you and I, as the most densely populated state in the country, as opposed to Florida, right? But, and, and I really don't want to make this political because I think, you know, we see it on our Facebook, right? On our Instagram, on our Twitter, people mm -hmm. tend to make COVID political that, hey, you know, look at Cuomo and Murphy, they're destroying their states while Abbott and DeSantis in Florida and Texas are governing a lot better and look how well those states are doing. I don't want to make it political, but it seems like that seems to be sort of like the fallback mechanism for most people where, hey, there's, there's there's a staunch difference about how we're governing. I don't know about you, but like it's something that really doesn't sit well with me because it seems like people always want to politicize COVID. Well, everybody wants to politicize everything these days. But when it comes to COVID, the reality is, you know, the grass always seems greener on the other side. We're talking about two different states, uh, two different climates, uh, population density and everything. There are stark differences. Can you learn something from other states? Absolutely. There may be uh, things in their response, especially with how they dealt with seniors and aging that may have been more appropriate than how we've dealt with it in our state. So it doesn't hurt to look at different responses to see you know, to learn best practices. In a, in, in a way, everybody in uh, leadership, regardless of state, is uh, learning as they go along. You know, they're all adjusting and it's whether or not they're willing to adjust, be flexible and learn from their mistakes, try and, you know, look at what they're doing right, continue to do that, look at what they're doing wrong and, you know, 
correct uh, to improve. I mean, it's a very delicate balance. You know, you and I are both uh, both agree COVID isn't a hoax. Um, it's yeah. very real. We've seen people yeah. that are close to us suffer greatly, um, pass away. And so it's something that's very real. And so we want to protect people. You, you know, you want somebody that's going to protect the health of it, you know, their residents, but also at the same time, um, there's very real, real economic consequences that we are seeing every day. And so, you know, the, the thing is, I mean, I've bartended. And so I have a lot of friends that are still in, in that, um, in that field, that is something that is, you know, a career for them, or it's a supplemental income. That's very important. Um, you know, through that, I know people that own restaurants and bars and, yeah. you know, there are certain sectors that are suffering. There are a lot of people that have the, uh, ability to work from home, work remotely. And a lot of those people, um, that don't have that experience and, um, uh, are still getting a consistent paycheck and are in a way comfortable are the ones that are supportive of these measures. The ones that are out there that need, you know, that are in um, career fields that are suffering are the ones that are probably not, you know, Murphy supporters right now. So um, it really remains to be seen um, when it comes to this pandemic, you know, his chances. I mean, I think there's always a chance for success for him because of those numbers uh, when it comes to polling, but you know, I would like to think that this is uh, an opportunity for a Republican to become governor. Well, you know, again, history is not on his side, but, you know, polling might tell you differently. And certainly, you know, the big base in New Jersey, especially in the urban areas, right up here where I live in Hudson County, Jersey City, mm -hmm. you know, nearby Patterson, Newark, Trenton, Elizabeth, New Brunswick, down by you, you know, near Camden, for example. Like those are obviously the big blue areas, right? The big urban centers where, you know, the Democratic Party in New Jersey has a strong electorate. And, you know, looking at some numbers here, and again, and I just want to throw some numbers at people here tonight for our viewers that aren't aware, you know, back in 2017, when Phil Murphy was running against uh, Lieutenant Governor Kim Godano, I mean, he won by an overwhelming margin. It was 56% to about 42%. Uh, Phil Murphy received 1,203,110 votes, and Kim Godano received 899,000 583 votes. So by and large, when you look at that march, and it seemed like overwhelming. But the number that should really stand out for everybody uh, about this was the turnout was only 38.5% of registered voters. Mm -hmm. And again, whether it's Republicans that said, hey, listen, the reason we have Phil Murphy is because people didn't turn out. But I would say this. Um, I know Kim Godano personally. Don't know if she's watching tonight. I don't know if some of her um, people in, in, her, in her circle are watching. But I liked Kim. I'm always going to have a special place in my heart for Kim, because when I was running for state assembly in 2011, you know, Kim made it a point to come up to Hudson County, a county where, let's be honest, Republicans do not win yeah. any really. Um, I mean, the last time that a Republican won a legislative seat, I think in Hudson County, I, I believe was Jose Arango, who's currently the, the county chair, yeah. right? Now. That was like, that was the eighties during Tom Kane. That's, yeah. I mean, that's more than a lifetime ago, but you know, again, Kim's a great woman. She, I think she was put in a really tough spot because irrespective of what we think, again, it's not, you know, 2009 Chris Christie that's on our mind. It's the eight years of Chris Christie. And again, she was just thrown in a really bad spot to run as the lieutenant governor when, let's be honest, Chris Christie for the last two years of his, of his second term wasn't in New Jersey, Maria. He was around the country running for president, polling mm -hmm. literally zero almost, you know, when he was, when he was running. And yeah. it, for a lot of people, he was like wasting time and money when he could have been here in you know, in New Jersey, in Trenton, working with the legislature, right? It just seems like back in 2017, everything sort of aligned perfectly for Phil Murphy to win, and he did. And he did. <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely correct. I, it really, uh, you know, and I don't know if you want to start talking about the Republican candidates, but it really remains to be seen as to whether or not they can generate that interest and get out the vote. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's extremely important. and you know, um, I, I don't know. I think, you know, with vote by mail, there was a lot of criticism nationally with vote by mail ballots, but we've seen in New Jersey, um, it was done fairly well and it really did get out the vote a lot. And so that may be uh, a tool to be utilized, but I think that there certainly is an opportunity for a Republican to succeed against Murphy. Well, it's interesting. And again, talk about vote by mail this year and certainly looking at the electorate. And, and here's some numbers that should really obviously open our eyes about what the electorate looks like. So according to the State Board of Elections right now, um, 
Democrats comprise 38.8% of registered voters in New Jersey, while Republicans are only comprised 22% of the electorate. Mm -hmm. But well, the big number, obviously, is for unaffiliated independent voters like me. I mean, we're at 37.8%. So yeah. something that I've talked about, and I had Jack Chitarelli on my Real Talk show on Monday nights, and I'm actually I'm going to have him on this Thursday, my Insider NJ podcast, and we'll talk about this. But you know, again, let's go back to 2000, you know, 2009. You know, then candidate Chris Christie um, was a very strong personality, and he was able to galvanize not just only Republicans but a lot of independents against a governor who, let's be honest. John Corzine was atrocious. I mean, I can use other words, but this is a family-friendly program. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. <laughs> but John Corzine was just atrocious. He was dreadful. And even yet, Chris Christie still only won by about, I'm looking at numbers here, I think about almost 5%. So mm -hmm. Chris had to literally get every Republican to come on board, and he had to really galvanize independents to come on board as well. And that's why he won. I think that sort of effort is going to, is, is what's necessary this year for whoever the Republican candidate is. So, and, and speaking of that, um, you know, I, you know, talked to Jack Chiarelli uh, this couple weeks ago here, you know, again, on my Real Talk show, as I mentioned, I'm going to have him on this Thursday, my Insider NJ podcast. But Maria, you know, I like Jack and Jack's a friend of mine. We talk off the air. And, and when I mean that he's a friend of mine, like I'm not Stephen A. Smith from Sports Center. Like I, I just met him five minutes ago and he's my friend. No, I'm, I know Jack personally. Okay. And this is the thing. Um, he's a nice guy. He is a former legislator. But what I'm hearing, though, Maria, across the state is that's just not going to be enough. Like, he's going to have to take it. If, if he wins the primary, again, then there are other people going to jump in. We'll talk about some of those names in a minute. But it just seems like if he is the nominee, he's going to have to almost duplicate. And, again, I don't want to bring this up as the blueprint because it's not. But mm -hmm. that 2009 Christie, that's what beat a Democrat incumbent. A lot of people are saying to me privately, I don't know if Jack has it in him to do that if he's the nominee. I don't know. Like, what are you hearing? Because I know you have really good sources, too. So, well, first of all, I want to go back to the unaffiliated. Anybody that's been involved in politics knows that the knows the rule of thirds. And there's the third on your left, the third on the right and the third in the middle. And you have to get the third in the middle. And that is what's going to help you win an election. So, one, I think it's great that Doug Steinhardt isn't in the primary. I think that having a primary with two very strong personalities, uh, I think it would have made it that much harder, especially when you have somebody that wants to really bring, uh, really wants in a primary, when you're really basically talking to your base, which is the, you know, the ultra right. Uh, it makes it difficult to really galvanize those people that are in the center in a general election. So I think right now it's great that while there's still a primary, you have a leading candidate that can really just focus on the issues of New Jersey and, you know, their their contrast with Murphy. Now, as far as Jack Chitarelli, uh, I think that he, I personally think he does have the personality. I think that he is somebody that is um, very engaging in a different way. He doesn't have to, you don't have to be bombastic. Yeah, you're right. But he is somebody that's very charismatic, very engaging, and he has a way of talking about complicated policy, uh, communicating complicated policy and his ideas, his vision in a way that connects with many different people. Um, he's able to simplify a message very well, get to the point, be concise, because he really does understand what he's talking about. He's not somebody that just regurgitates talking points. Mm -hmm. He understands issues and he's able to relay them to others in a really way. And so I think that he's somebody that can connect in a different way. The difference is infrastructure. You know, is he going to have the ability to create an infrastructure that's going to have a really strong ground game, um, yeah. really hit at, you know, grassroots campaigning, really utilize social media in the right way, um, target in the right way. I mean, what we've seen in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, on a national level, uh, which helped in their states is that Democrats were well organized. Yeah. And so whoever wins is going to have to be well organized and ultra strategic. No, you're right about that. And speaking of being organized, I mean, that is going to fall on the New Jersey GOP. And yes. not to come down on them. Again, I want to be as diplomatic as I can because I get accused of not being diplomatic or not having decorum, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like NJ GOP now in a transition from leadership, right? You know, Doug Steinhardt stepped down when he was going to run for governor and that's no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you know, the Republican Party in New Jersey, Maria, has to really get 
all their ducks in a, in a row. And they, I think they really have to dot their I's and cross their T's. And I think that's proven to be difficult because, and I'll sort of use this as an example, because, you know, in 2019, when Republicans made some gains in the legislature, not, I mean, modest, right? You know, like Mike Testa won a state Senate seat that like was viewed as almost impossible. He won that. And again, that was momentous for Republicans in New Jersey. But then the following year, obviously last year, when it came to the state Republican Party supporting Republican candidates, right, in all the House races, uh, again, it seemed like it was almost like they were powerless. And the only competitive race that, I mean, listen, I really thought of all the House races that Republicans had a chance to win, to maybe pick up a seat. And again, no disrespect to Billy Premp and others, because, you know, th th those are really uphill battles in those districts. But I really thought Tom King Jr., was going to beat Malinowski. Like I was almost convinced. I didn't bet money, thank God. But I, I said, if, if I have to pick one, I thought it was going to be Kane Jr. And he didn't. He came up short. I think it was like a 5,000 vote margin, which is really razor slim. But you know what? I feel that th that's an example where maybe the state GOP could have done more. And again, I'm not the chairman. I'm not campaigning to be NJ GOP or chair. Again, I have too much on my plate. But it just seemed that they could have done more and maybe they didn't, whether it's raising money, whether, as you mentioned, targeting, using social media responsibly. I don't think they did enough for Kane Jr. and others. And here we go. We That's why we get people like Andy Kim reelected. That's why we get people like Coleman reelected. I mean, that I don't know. That speaks to that, and I don't mean to interrupt, but that speaks to the fact that people are uh, not really understanding how some of those people won, actually won. So you know, while we would like to give, some people wanted to give a lot of credit to the NJGOP for Senator Testa's win in that district, uh, Testa and down the line, the assembly, uh, the two assembly candidates as well. You know, people forget that Senator Testa was chairman and they have been building an infrastructure locally for some time. That goal has been something that they've been working towards for a very long time. And so people forget that we have a local infrastructure. All politics is local. And so when you don't have strong county organizations uh, where they're unified, working together, fundraising themselves, uh, constantly on the ground, recruiting, uh, building a bench, that's when you see what we're seeing now, you know, when we look at Andy Kim's win um, against Dave Richter, Burlington County, they are rebuilding. They don't quite, they're, they're, they're not what they used to be. Yeah. And that's not a knock on their leadership or anybody that's currently uh, involved in the Burlington County GOP right now. It's just that they are in a transition. They, uh, they had a previous chair that, uh, I, you know, I don't know that there was really a coordinated effort to groom the next chair and to really build that infrastructure and keep that infrastructure going. All politics is local. And we have you'll see it in other counties right now, too. There's infighting amongst Republicans within these counties and these local Republican clubs. And at the end of the day, I mean, people have to stop fighting over, you know, it's, it's, when you think about it, a lot of it's silly. They have to come together. They have to be unified and they have to start building an infrastructure if they want to see wins. You obviously want a strong state Republican party, but you know, the party, the statewide party can only help so much. That's right. No, start taking care of their backyards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and folks, if you're just joining us here live on Facebook, Certainly, I've just received a notification that uh, live stream apparently is having trouble logging on to Facebook and streaming. What a surprise when it comes to Facebook and the incompetence of Mark Zuckerberg. So, you know, I'm not surprising here, especially after my seven day Facebook jail sentence. So I'm not surprised that now all of a sudden, you know, we're having trouble. But we are sharing. And obviously, for those of you tuning in right now, share, share, share on your Facebook folks here uh, for the inaugural edition of Talking Jersey with Maria and Fernando here uh, on Facebook and obviously via StreamYard as well. You know, Maria, you, you brought up something interesting about, again, organization. And you brought up something that really stood out for me, especially about Doug Penhart. And, you know, we saw that it was all whisper, it was all rumored last year he was in a run. Um, and obviously I, he waited until after November 3rd to make an announcement. And then before you know it, you know, he, you know, his candidacy, you know, disappeared quicker than a virgin on prom night. You know, it was like, boom, that's it. And yeah. um, I, I'm hearing a lot of different whispers about what prompted this. I'm hearing that hey, you know, he's part of a very lucrative law firm. Obviously, running for governor would not suit him, obviously, since, again, and this is just all speculation, 
the, what I hear. Yeah, come that, on, don't you think about that before you run? You know what you do for a living. You don't have that as a consideration before you decide to announce. I'm not buying it. I agree, but again, <laughs> the consideration was that certainly he is a partner in that law firm. They have contracts with the state. Mm -hmm. Again, he's making a good amount of money there. Again, God bless him. But certainly, you know, his law firm perhaps maybe was not thrilled with him doing this. Now, again, whether or not this was discussed at length, I'm assuming that he would have sat down with his partners and say, hey, listen, by the way, I'm thinking about running for governor. What do you think? Do you think this is going to harp, you know, maybe hinder our contracts with, with municipalities or whatever? You know, obviously one of his partners is former governor Jim Florio. So, you know, again, there's a lot of rumors and in innuendo out there about why Steinhardt got into it and then he jumped out which seems to be like maybe it's clearing the way for Cittarelli now, but now I'm hearing about different names. But before we get to those names, though, did you hear the same thing about Steinhardt and why he pulled out? Oh, I heard. Yeah, I mean, I heard the. I mean, he. I believe he was on Save Jersey saying that it had to do, or there was some sort of interview saying that it had to do with work or it was work related. But like I said, I'm not buying it. I mean, at the end of the day, he's. There's been whispers about a possible gubernatorial run for Doug Steinhardt for some time. And if he didn't sit down with his law partners, I am quite certain they would have said something to him like, hey, we're hearing these rumors and we don't think it's the best idea because of X, Y, Z. So, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. And um, but you know what, if that's what he says, it is fine. Either way, he's out. And now we can rally around a candidate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there were other things, you know, Jack Cittarelli announced pretty early on. He had been working uh, different county organizations, uh, putting, you know, really getting those inroads, fundraising. He was building an infrastructure for a very long time. And, you know, when you're coming this late in the game, it's just sometimes it's game theory. You're just not going to get it. No, you're right. And it's funny because when I've spoken to Jack off the air and I remember having him on in the summer of 2019, you know, he said to me very openly and honestly, he's like, listen, one of my biggest regrets. And if I have to play Monday morning quarterback about what didn't go right for me in 2017 was the fact that I got into it too late. And it showed with obviously the margin in which Kim Godano won. Obviously, Kim had obviously a head start. She's a lieutenant governor. Certainly, she had a better infrastructure, a ground game because of, you know, being part of the establishment. And I think Jack recognized that. And he said that on the air. He was very open about it. Like, hey, I should have jumped in earlier. I didn't. I learned my lesson. And sure enough, like I said, I remember being uh, at the Trump National Golf Course uh, down in, down the shore in, mm -hmm. I believe, August of 2019. And he was already hit. I mean, he pretty much had not announced officially yet, but he was attending every Republican event. He was shaking hands, you know, doing the thing he had, you know, did they have to do. And sure enough, I think that's why right now he's got such a good head start. Um when it comes to, you know, raising money, going up and down the state, trying to win like county organizations, mm -hmm. nominations. right now, again, I don't know how many he's won so far. I don't know how many have declared for him, but he, again, having that head start, I think really benefited Jack this time. Maria. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was part of the reason why he announced sooner uh, and knew that he had to hit the ground running. Oh, he had to really start sooner. It takes time. He's somebody that still doesn't have, even though he was at a primary against Guadano, he still doesn't have that name recognition statewide. So that's, I mean, it, it was a smart move on his part and it's obviously paying off because he's still in the race and, you know, other people aren't other people that would be considered leading candidates aren't. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I'm just sort of looking at my notes here from my interview with him on real talk recently. And I, mm -hmm. one thing that he was very adamant about and whether or not he uses it as a, as a slogan or he just uses it on the campaign trail, whether he's gone all the way up to Bergen County, all the way up to, down to Atlantic County, it seems like he's just very openly asking people, like, are you better off than you were four years ago? Obviously, you know, quoting Ronald Reagan when he did that in 1980, when he was running against President Jimmy Carter. Listen, it's very cliche-ish, but it seems like it's something that maybe is effective, you know, like asking people straight up, like, are you better off than you were four years ago? And listen, taking COVID out of the way, mm -hmm. even COVID, I think there were still pockets of the state, Maria, that we're probably still upset with Murphy because, it, you know, we're seeing the budget continue to balloon. We're seeing spending still skyrocketing. And again, Murphy wasn't being held accountable because as we all know, institutions like the star ledger and NJTV, again, no disrespect to Tom Moran. I'm trying to get him on my program or David. <laughs> who, they're both ducking me. Um, but regardless, it just seems like they, those institutions that we're relying on 
for media weren't holding Murphy and the legislature accountable. And it mm -hmm. just, again, that's another, that's another part of the disadvantage that Jack or whoever going to be, the nominee is going to be that no one's really holding the legislature and their feet to the fire and more so governor Murphy, because Maria, honestly, like as a homeowner and taxpayer, I'm sure you can relate to this. Like I follow the budget closely. I'm mm -hmm. a policy nerd. Policy was part of one of the, you know my concentrations in grad school. It's really, it's infuriating to see how tone deaf Trenton is for mm -hmm. some time now, because it's, you know, again, and people get on me, Hey, Fernando, why don't you ever, why don't you ever come down on Republicans or conservatives in New Jersey? Like, why are you so harsh against Democrats? Yeah, I come down on everyone, I'm equal opportunity well, hater. But, but my answer to Maria to everybody that always, you know, chastises me either privately or online, and my answer is always the same. Yeah, well, guess what? You know why I don't chastise conservatives and Republicans in New Jersey? Because they have zero say in policy. They have zero say in how we spend money. We, they have zero well, say in how the budget's prepared. I mean, by and large, right? Because Democrats have run the legislature predominantly since 2001. Mm -hmm. And again, sink or swim, that's just the truth. So yeah, Republicans, you know, obviously you were in the legislature. You had a say. You certainly had bills passed through committee and then obviously up for votes. So I get it. Republicans aren't completely powerless. But when it comes to budget, at the end of the day, it's Democrats in Trenton that like hold the purse strings. And that's why I'm always coming down on them. And people say, well, you're not fair. Well, Fernando, well, I say to them, well, guess what? Well, when Republicans are in the majority and they have a say in the budget, then you know what? Then I'll come down on Republicans. But until then, sure. like, who, like, who do we blame then? Well, we have to, you know, listen, I mean, on some level, Republicans need to maybe blame themselves a little bit. No. Um, obviously, yes, we're going to blame Democrats. We're going to try and hold those that are putting forth policies that are horrific, that are bad for um, everyday residents, constituents, uh, that are just generally bad policies. Yes, we're going to hold them accountable and let everybody know this is a bad policy and here's why. But also the Republican Party, again, we're constantly pointing the finger at each other as to why we're not gaining seats. And I think we need to have a little more self-awareness and take a look at why our message what, well, what message do we even have in New Jersey anymore besides saying Democrats suck? Uh, what what counterpoint do we actually offer in terms of vision and policy that is applicable to the area that we're in? You know, regionally, while New Jersey is one of the, you know, very small state, but yet densely populated, it's also a very diverse state. And by yeah. diversity, I'm not talking about ethnicity, um, just even geographically. You know, there's urban areas, rural areas, agriculture. Each region of New Jersey is very different and they have very different needs and different issues and different outlooks when it comes to values. And we have to stop trying to eat each other and realize that, you know, we have to allow and 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 have candidates that are representative of those areas in, within our party and work together. Because at the end of the day, you know, Republicans working together, even if we're diverse in our views, if, if you really are supportive of conservative Republican values, you should feel that that's better than Democrats. No, I agree. No, no. And so Republicans really need to start checking themselves and realizing, listen, you know, one, Trump, you know, especially in New Jersey, Trump wasn't successful. Tr um, the party is more than one person. And we have to start really rallying around ideas and values and policies that are going to um, really, really resonate with people of New Jersey. No, yeah, listen, you're right. And it's funny, you, you, you mentioned the president and certainly I think that that's something that Republicans or conservatives- By in the Jersey way, we're not live anymore. I keep getting messages popping up like, what happened to the video? No, we're not live. Okay, I mean, no. still recording. So, I mean, folks, again, I don't know what happened here. Uh, for some reason, StreamYard tell me it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, we're still live in the sense of recording, um, I can always, you know, share the episode in a few minutes when we're off, obviously. And uh, okay. you know, do the same. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why StreamYard did that. Um, I might want to change it up next time when we do our next episode, and we just okay. do Facebook live. Maybe that that'll work too. Um, yeah. But you know, Maria, it's funny you mentioned that because I think with with the president, um, obviously he'll be out of office in five days. And for a lot of conservatives, libertarians, just registered Republicans in New Jersey. I think that now is going to be sort of like a reboot. I think that they're going to have to do. And, you know, whether or not Jack Chitterelli wants to sort of still rely on that base that's still strong, because there's still pockets in New Jersey that are still very much MAGA. And yeah. whether or not that's going to sort of dissolve slowly, but surely, again, remains to be seen, right? So 
I think it's going to be up to Jack because I think also too, you know, sink or swim, Murphy's going to try to attach again. If it is, let's say it is Chitterelli as the nominee, you know, the, the Democrats and, and and Governor Murphy are, will be smart to, you know, from a strategic pers- perspective to say, listen, we're going to attach Chitterelli to Trump, and whether or not that's going to resonate with some Republicans, that could also be catastrophic, right? Because sure. you know, I think Jack was one that you know, in many instances, he denounced the president or sort of like shied away from President Trump. But, you know, if you remember last January down in South Jersey, right, in Wildwood, like he was there at the president's rally, which was insane. But, you know, I think it's something to definitely keep an eye on. Now, in terms of other Republicans, though, I'm looking at some other names here. I know Brian Levine, former Somerset County freeholder, um, is also mulling a run for governor. I think that maybe that's close to being finalized and maybe his candidacy is about to be out there. What have you heard about Brian Levine? Do you like him? I saw a recent interview with my insider NJ colleague, Max Pizarro, where, and I said this to some people off the air, like, I, I, I don't know Brian personally. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, the interview format, I think was poor. Again, nothing against Max Pizarro. He's a great writer, but he's not a good, he's not a great interviewer on, on video. He's just not. And again, it's not a slight to him. He, you know, this might get back to him and I don't really care, but because we don't really like each other. But the point is that I know, <laughs> so maybe I know, it is a All right, I know, just I know it's surprising. I know people dislike me. I, I, you're shocked. I know. Um, but I thought that that interview, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but I, I don't think it did Brian any favors. Mm-hmm. I think it kind of made him come out a little bit flat. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, he's going to have to overcome that. If he's going to jump into this now in mid January, as you said, it's a late start. It's a late start. I just don't see it happening for him. I think it's a great thing to uh, get out there and run. I would encourage anyone that wants to run to run for office. Um, And it's always nice to, and I think it's always good to get yourself out there, uh, put out your voice, talk about the issues that you care about, because it may resonate for some people and it may set him up for a future run. But I don't think that um, I don't think that he's going to have much success, uh, unfortunately. And, and it's just, it's very unrealistic. And I think it would take a miracle for him to, uh, based on what I've seen so far, and I don't know him personally, but based on what I've read, uh, seeing that interview to really, uh, you know, make up a lot of that lost ground, you know, that that's been lost with having a candidate that's announced sooner. Again, fundraised heavily is building that infrastructure, is really making inroads. I, I don't see him catching up. I agree. I agree. Um, now, moving on to some legislative races, because obviously all 120 seats are up. Uh, yeah. We know last week, uh, I'm sorry, earlier this week, it was breaking that uh, Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg out of Bergen County would be stepping down this year, so she's not running. And that brings up a lot of you know speculation about who's going to run. I know on her assembly line, uh, some of the women huddle, uh, who has some ties in Hudson County, obviously, but certainly has been very vocal. It seems like she's jumped into into that race and thrown her name into the ring. I know the other assemblymen in that district as well. Uh, it seems that, you know, if that's the case and whoever wins that seat in the state Senate, that means now that, you know, Teresa Ruiz subsequently, should she win re-election, which seems like a lock in her district in Essex yeah. County, would now become the Senate majority leader. Um, how historic is this? I mean, again, you're, you're a Latina, you're a former legislator. When you see these sort of advances, whether it's Republican or Democrats, um, you know, how does it make you feel? I mean, I think it's great. I think it's great just to have new blood. I mean, when I said great, when you announced that Senator uh, Senator Weinberg is retiring, it's not a knock to her past service. I mean, I disagree on a lot of different policy issues with her. But I mean, she's also done a lot of great things in her time. Um, She's worked on domestic violence legislation, which is something that's very important to me. And, you know, I do applaud uh, and I I give credit where credit's due. And I applaud her work there. But at the end of the day, I mean, she's been there for a very long time. And we see this all the time where you have somebody that's in uh, an elected position forever. And it's you know, at some point you want to see new blood. You want to see changes because that means new leadership, new ideas. Um, and it it opens up the door for other people. So now where you have this vacancy now and you're, you know, possibly it could be uh, Valerie Veneri Huddle or um, Assemblyman Johnson, uh, who I believe is also announcing a run. You That opens a seat for somebody new in the assembly. 
And I believe they announced uh, a person that they would uh, rally around recently. And I'm sorry that I'm unprepared with that name, uh, but it was, I think it was today. And, um, but I think it's great. And I think it's great to see somebody like Senator Ruiz, who, like I said, I mean, I don't always agree, but um, she's somebody that has uh, been vocal on issues. There are issues that I do agree with her on. And I think it's great to see just new blood. You know, would I like it to be uh, Republicans as a Senate majority leader? Of course. But I think it's great to, again, see new blood. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is that, you know, sometimes these people need to retire sooner. I agree with you. Uh, again, <laughs> a moniker of like lifelong politicians um, and career politicians really doesn't sit well with people. I think that we, no. we, start, we start seeing at the national level how ineffective they can become after a while and how it's a turnoff. Right. And we're seeing it here in New Jersey. Let me ask you this it though. Rests on their laurels. And at some point, you know, we really need that 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 fresh, fresh view. New I ideas. Agree. I, I agree. And something I want to pick your brain on today, because I know that especially on social media and Facebook, and I don't want to embarrass him because he's a good friend of mine, or he's a good friend of yours. Uh, he's a very respected attorney, but um, you know, Jordan Ricards uh, is a guy that uh, always is posting very interesting. Uh, Facebook content. Uh, he has a great website, you know, conservativeopinion.com. And I'm sort of looking at some recent comments he made. And I think that, you know, we talked off the air and I had to sort of, you know, discuss some things with him. And this is the way I'm going to sort of look at whether you're a conservative or a Republican moving forward about the party having a reboot. And listen, five days away, Joe Biden, you know, whether we like it or not, will be the 46th president. Yep. Whether or not he's awake on Wednesday, I don't know, maybe we'll say. You know, but, um, you know, and this is the thing, Maria, a lot of people would ask me off the air or even content when, in my other media programs. They ask me, listen, you know, you don't come out and openly say you support the president, but there are just some things that you either enable or you rationalize and you right. find a way to sort of justify. And my answer has always been the same. And, and, and I'll sort of throw this at you because I think maybe this is where we can sort of dissect it a little bit and pick each other's brain. What I've always said from you know, and again, this Wednesday, a new, a new president will be inaugurated. I remember being in Washington, D.C. four years ago. I remember going to that inauguration on a Friday. Okay, it was a little bit rainy and mucky. We had the Women's March, the inaugural one the very next day, which just was insane down there, as well as I wore in New Jersey. But I remember, obviously, that it was a new chapter, right? And I think for anyone that identified as a conservative, like myself, you know, um, or a Republican or, or Libertarian, I think that, you know, listen, the guy ran as a populist. I mean, he was far from being a populist because he was a billionaire. But I think that for me, the idea of populism and being a populist resonated where, hey, listen, pre-COVID, if there were certain economic policies in place that were working and we started seeing it, I was a fan. If we started seeing certain judges being nominated to vacancies in appellate courts, right, to the Supreme Court and everything, and they're, they're, they're judging, again, I'm not an attorney, but as a layman and just as an academic, I said, hey, listen, I'd rather have judges nominated to the court that are maybe more constructionist and more about reading the document as is, right? Not, not as we hear, oh, liberal activism or liberal judges, whatever. The point is that as a layman, I said mm -hmm. to myself, hey, these are people I can identify with. These are economic policies I can identify with. But believe it or not, and I'll be very honest and say, it, in my mind, I sort of just sort of brushed off like, I get it. The president doesn't have decorum. The president doesn't act presidential. And the president doesn't have, I think, that level of civility that we expect out of the office. I get it. I found a way in my mind to sort of brush it off and say, well, I can live with that because A, B, and C is getting done. And I agree with these policies. Okay. Maria, I don't think that makes me a bad person, but I think that a lot of people, again, I'm not saying I represent New Jerseyans, but I think a lot of people kind of thought the way I did, maybe didn't articulate it, um, as well as I just did, or maybe mm -hmm. just, like, oh, I don't care. You know, he doesn't give an F. He says what he thinks. I, I get it. That's not me, but I was mm -hmm. more of a policy person. And I think that that's how I found a way to justify, hey, I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm his biggest fan, but I can justify policy and saying, hey, that's why he deserved another four years. Again, mm -hmm. hey, whatever. That's how I thought. I don't think it makes me a bad conservative, but I think that now we have to sort of do a reboot where, okay, he lost. We're going to have to distance ourselves from that brand. But again, when it, when it comes to policy, there's a lot of policies that I think most people would say, you know what, they were working. But you know what, it's the delivery and the execution of the person 
that stains the message. That's how I look at it. That's how I you justify know, it. I kind of think like, and maybe I'm wrong in this, you know, train of thought, but I kind of feel like it's old news. Um, and I know that sounds terrible, but guess what? He's going to be gone. Uh, yeah. He has a few days left of his term and then it's over. And then we're on to a new president and we're on to a new term. And so do I want to focus on Trump anymore? Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are some things that, you know, policies, I, I agree with some of the criminal justice reforms, you yeah. know, yes, we can talk about policy, uh, we can talk about message, we can talk about tone and yeah. all of that. But I think at the, end of, at the end of the day, what we need to do as Republicans, if we want to be successful, is not continue down this path of, um, you know, I, I guess nostalgia uh, of, of Trump or, you know, continually talking about Trump because he's no longer president. He is not going to be president anymore come, you know, next week. And we need to start looking to the future. So who are the candidates that we're going to uh, start to look at um, as people that could be possible contenders in 2024? Um, who are, uh, you know, what what ideas and message do we want to put out there? What is our vision? You know, yeah. what is our platform? Yeah. We can't even agree on a platform anymore. I mean, you have people that I've considered for so many years to be ultra conservatives um, being called rhinos, which is just so juvenile um yeah. because maybe they disagreed with one thing or they leverage one slight criticism of trump like i didn't like the way he said that and all of a sudden they're a rhino you know republicans have to get it together um if they want to succeed in the coming years you know the party is bigger than one person yeah. and we have to really start um coming together as a team looking at um you know, focusing on message issues, having a vision um, in New Jersey specifically, we need to focus on New Jersey issues. You know, yeah. there are a lot of races that have potential for success in the eighth district. Uh, Senator Don Adiego is running. She's going to be running as a Democrat. This is the first time for her. She was a Republican and uh, Assemblywoman Jean Stanfield, who is a former um, sheriff in uh, Burlington County and now is Assemblywoman in the eighth district is running against her. And that means, and Ryan Peters isn't running. So that means new blood in the assembly. And there's an opportunity there to uh, keep this district, you know, uh, red. Because uh, let's be honest, Senator Don Adiego has been around for a long time. And even though there are people that don't like her flip, um, there are people that do. And she's been around. She's a name. She has those relationships. She has that infrastructure in the community. So, you know, there is a chance for success. But so does Gene Sanfield. That's a very that's going to be a competitive race, an exciting race. And what we need to do is start focusing on these people in New Jersey and stop worrying about Trump. That's simple. No, listen, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, right. you're, no, you're right about that. No, you're, right. no, you're right about that. And I think that for a lot of people who identify as conservatives and Republicans in New Jersey, I think that now's the time to again focus on New Jersey. Yes. And listen, are we there some great conservatives here? Yeah, <laughs> Republicans that should be yeah. elevated. And there are some districts in New Jersey that for Republicans are winnable. Now, again, yeah. we're talking about, for example, like, you know, when we use the narrative of, well, guess what? If Republicans can just win five Senate seats, they'll win the majority. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of hard when it's only 40 seats. You know, that's yeah. a tall order. Can they maybe gain one this or two this this November? It's possible. Mm -hmm. I think Republicans can make some strides. In the assembly as well, but I think at the end of the day, I think listen. I think there's here's a variable maybe that not, not that we've talked about it, but I think there's a variable that people got to think about. I think in the coming months, how Governor Murphy continues to respond to COVID and what happens in New Jersey, I think is going to be monumentally important. Sure. Like again, the rollout of the vaccine. I think whether or not the governor is going to allow again when they, let's say indoor dining, if he mm -hmm. allows it to go up to fifty percent, if he allows other businesses to reopen. Um, and maybe loosen some of the restrictions. I think mm -hmm. that's something that small business owners are going to, you know, pay yeah. attention to. And I think everyone else. And I think that at some point, though, Maria, like Democrats who have just sort of gone with Murphy and have not questioned this and have just said, okay, yeah, Governor, he, you know, here are your EOs, sign them all you want, and this is what you do. Okay. In some districts, like up here where I live, like in the 31st, the 32nd, 33rd, mm -hmm. Democrats are safe, right? So the state senators like stack. And Cunningham and Sacco, they're safe. I think all six assembly seats are safe too. But yeah. I think there, 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 there's going to be some districts where some where people might just say, hey, these are Democrats and maybe establishment people for a while that have kind of like, yes, 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 Murphy, this entire four years during mm -hmm. COVID. Now, hey, 
we should hold them accountable. Now, I'm not even thinking about like the progressive Democrats that are trying to primary like life for Democrats, right? Like the Joe Cryans, right? Or the mm -hmm. Ron Rosses or the Nicholas Scutari's. Like those guys seem to be pretty safe in their districts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I think when it comes to, I think it's something to keep an eye on. Like we have to see what happens with COVID because if Governor Murphy still is being punitive, like, listen, that's, I think that's a good word to use in terms of some of his policies, right? When it comes to the EOs. People are going to pay attention and say, wait a minute, we have these establishment Dems here in the legislature. They're kind of just like enabling them. Maybe they need to, to go. I think that's mm -hmm. something that Republicans can, can jump on. I just don't know if they can verbalize it correctly. Yeah, I, I think it's verbalizing it correctly. It's patience. It's having a long term plan. You know, when we've seen uh, districts flip from red to blue, I think they thought it was just some overnight success. Uh, you know, that, that this one person was just like some miracle. And, th and that means that they haven't been paying attention. Um, in districts that have flipped, they have been uh, building that ground game and they've had patience and they've been slowly, slowly, uh, you know, growing uh, the party in that area in order to create that flip. And so when we look at Senator Gopal and how that district turned, uh, that wasn't an overnight Thing. I mean, yeah. that was his plan. That was his game for years, just like with Senator Testa. He yeah. had been working very hard for years. So I think we have to realize one, it's hard work. It takes time. Uh, yeah. That politics is local. So that means we need to strengthen our local parties, our local clubs, our local county infrastructure, and really start there and not just rely on the NJGOP. Um, they need to support those local parties. They need to support those local um, organizations and really focus on long-term strategy. These flips, getting five seats is not going to happen overnight. It yeah. really isn't. Yeah. And we need to really start developing candidates. Uh, there are so many awesome people out there, young people out there, people in the community that are community leaders that have really great ideas. And we need to start identifying these people and bringing them in sooner rather than later. Uh, there are just so many things that we can be doing that, you know, in some areas we're doing, some we're not, we're just not doing it consistently. Uh, it just, it's a yeah. long-term plan. It really, really is. Redistricting is going to be important as well. In the future, we need to start, uh, being more vocal on these issues. I know that right? there's this, I know that there's this attitude of, you know, because we're in the minority, we can't accomplish anything. You know, I was in the minority party. It, you don't compromise on everything, but you can collaborate. And uh, and I would let party start to look forward, start to really stop looking in the past, stop complaining, and start looking to the future and really create that long-term vision for New Jersey. I mean, when I talk about, when I talk to people, you know, I don't want to just know why that guy's bad, you know, or why that person's bad. Obviously that does incentivize people to vote. There are a lot of people that vote because they're voting against a person, not for a person. But I think when it comes to growing our party locally um, and just, you know, slowly making those inroads, we do need to have a vision ourselves and ideas that resonate. No, Maria, listen, you're right. And I think that, again, it's it's going to be really hard based on the numbers I just gave before about the electorate and, and registrations. And I'm sure there'll, there'll be new Thank registrations. Done. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Listen. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people turning 18 this year who will register to vote. I'm sure there'll be others who maybe who have not registered to vote ever and maybe interested now because of what's going on in New Jersey. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. those people will ride. Again, Democrats still have the advantage there handily when it comes to that. But I think, again, I think it's going to be up to independents, which at the end of the day, those are the people like like myself that mm. unaffiliated voters are the ones that decide elections. Again, you know, 12 years ago, that's how Chris Christie won. And he still, listen, he still got every basic Republican vote and got a large sector of the independents to vote for him. And he still only beat Corzine by four or five points, if I remember the number correctly. And again, listen, again. The Democratic machine and the establishment has that advantage. So that was 12 years ago. Murphy's clearly is still going to have an advantage. I think he's going to have the public sector unions, right? Like CWA and JEA come out hard for him. And I think at the same time, it's like when I look at, and I was talking about this when I was pre-recording my Insider NG podcast yesterday, you know, the governor is still in his high 60s in terms of his job approval rating. I think that's yeah. still very high. 
but it's also, you know, polling is not exact science, right? Like, who are you polling? What's the standard deviation? Everything else, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to bore people with, you know, math. But I think that that's still interesting about, well, who are they polling? Where are they polling? I think that's also a variable I think we have to look at because I'm not saying it's low, but mm-hmm. I still think very high, especially if we're pockets of the state. There are business owners that are like, what? Like, it, yeah. it doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, do you hear that down South Jersey where you're at? Well, South Jersey, we're, you know, we're a whole other area. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it's pretty clear that South Jersey is, uh, unlike the rest of New Jersey, we're pretty, um, we're, we're certainly very different. Uh, and sh- yeah, sure, the attitude's a little different, uh, but we're also less densely populated uh, as compared to North Jersey. Yeah. Um, I, you know, yeah, I think that there is an opportunity for a Republican to win. Uh, is it difficult? Sure. Based on the, the numbers, even with you, when, when you account for the fact that maybe it's skewed, uh, you know, based on the numbers, it, it is going to be a battle. It is going to be a tough race. Uh, anybody that thinks it isn't is crazy. And I think, though, that's the important thing. If For those that support Murphy, you know, obviously they have the infrastructure, they have the numbers, and uh, there you go. You got to volunteer, get out there and work hard. And, you know, he certainly uh, stands a strong chance of success. But for those that support, you know, want to see a Republican and don't want to see Murphy in office, you know, the Republican Party, they're going to have to come together. You know, they really are going to have to come together, stop with the purity test of who's the most conservative, who had, you know, who kissed Trump's butt and really um, focus on, you know, a candidate, um, and support the Republican candidate, whoever is the leading candidate, whoever wins the primary, really just rally around this candidate and understand that this person has a general election to win. And, you know, that means that they're going to have to, you know, uh, talk about different issues that may not, you know, no candidate is going to ever be a hundred percent, um, exactly what you want. And um, it's crazy to think that anybody would. I'm never going to agree with anyone 100% of the time. Nobody's ever going to, even in a a marriage, nobody agrees with, and you still love them. You don't agree with them 100% of the time. If you can agree, you know, 60%, you got a great marriage, you know? So I think that we have to, Republicans, stop kind of eating our own. And I'm guilty of that sometimes, you know, I I get critical. I criticize everyone though. I criticize everyone, regardless of party. But I think we are, are going to have to come together and um, really put the differences aside and find, you know, the parts that unify us. And that's our strongest chance of success. No, I agree. I agree. And uh, as you know, we're about to wrap up here. We're about 50 minutes past the hour here. And uh, I'm going to do my best to download the episode and then share it and then blast it everywhere. Cause it seems like StreamYard was not cooperating with the stream. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Facebook, I think I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if it's Facebook or StreamYard, but I'm, you know, I'll be able to download the episode, but Maria, uh, this is, this has been great. I want to keep doing it in 2021 here with episodes and listen, it's 50 minutes and we covered a lot and there's still more we need to cover, but we'll definitely do that coming up in episode two. And we'll definitely keep everybody posted on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter about, when our next episode is and certainly we'll, you know, we'll take suggestions for topics because I'm sure there are people that want to have other things discussed that maybe we didn't cover. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Maria, it was mm-hmm. great to have you on here today. I'm going to do my best to download this and blast it and we'll see what the feedback is because I think that, listen, it's the, like the North South coming together here in Jersey. <laughs> it's like, it's like the dream team of like vocal politics, right? You and I. So, mm-hmm. uh, Keep it going, and uh, we'll. Uh, I'll see you again soon. We're gonna say bye to everybody here, and uh, again, folks. You know, for those of you that were able to tune in live, and then it got cut off, and then obviously for those of you that will watch the replay, um, I can't say it enough. Thank you so much for for joining us here, and certainly on behalf of my amazing co-host, New Jersey's premier advocate Maria Rodriguez Greg. Uh, we're gonna keep making noise. We're gonna keep making the establishment uncomfortable, and mm-hmm. we're gonna. Talking about things that, you know what, probably regular everyday New Jerseyans are thinking about. And you know what? You deserve to hear about it. And we'll we'll be proud to talk about it. So uh, we'll see you all again soon. Maria, any closing thoughts? Bye. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll see you all again soon, folks. Here, Thanks for joining us here for episode one of Maria and Fernando Talking Jersey right here on Facebook and also StreamYard. So we'll see you all again soon, folks. Take care, everyone. <laughs>